Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Arthur. It's good, great to be here again. Uh, last year, I remember it was so uh, it was so fun, and I remember uh, not thinking about this, but like so many people contact me afterward, like to work on things, and I had to say no because that's just how it was last year. But this year, I've got people in the lab, so are available in the lab. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Um, so last year I prepared five minutes. Of course, it, it, it could have taken 20 or 30 or 40. So this year I sort of prepared zero. So I, I, th I, th I figured it would take just five, which, which, which is good. Um, so let me find the, uh, the remote, um, which presumably is around here. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, somewhere. Okay. So, um, yeah, just, just great to be here. Now, I should say something about, um, you know, Howard Kuhnrother as well. I ran the Wharton um, Financial Institution Center for, you know, 12 or 15 years and, and with Dick Herring. And, um, you know, we had occasion to interact with Howard and Paul Kleindorfer, you know, you know, not infrequently. And, you know, his insights in putting things together in various ways were, were invaluable. So, so I miss him too. So let me um, just say then, um, you know, in recent years, um, I work on lots of things. I work on uh, sort of predictive modeling and machine learning kind of in general, but in macroeconomic and financial economic contexts in particular. And of course, that's not at all unrelated to climate. So I have a little sideline um, dealing, dealing with climate. And we've been focusing in recent years mostly on Arctic sea ice uh, for various reasons, which I won't go into depth on right now. But, but the Arctic is, is especially interesting, right? Because the whole planet is warming quickly, but the Arctic is warming two or three times as quickly. And you know, so it's kind of a, a, a window uh, into the future. And there are all sorts of extra pressing, um, you know, costs and benefits of, of warming in the Arctic. One benefit, I'll just say a benefit, the costs are, are overwhelming and, and we all know them, but one benefit is, is transarctic shipping. Um, you know, uh, once transarctic shipping opens up, which will happen in the September because that's the lowest ice month, um, you know, the, the costs of, say, going Rotterdam to Tokyo are gonna be cut in half. You know, literally. So from a global, you know, international trade perspective, which is really the, 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 the genesis of all, um, you know, economic benefits, um, this is a big, big deal. So, um, you know, so last year I talked about, like, when is the Arctic going to go ice free? And I'm not going to say anything more about that right now. That was last year. Uh, but that's kind of, if you think of that in real time, it's kind of like, like you know, predicting the future and a, and a recursive real time experiment might be like every month I forecast, you know, 12 months out. And I do that again and again and again every month, like a 12 step ahead repeated prediction sorts of, sort of situation. A different situation is I've got a fixed target month. Let's call it September, maybe September of uh, 2024, okay, um, because that's, in some September, that's when the Arctic's going to be ice free. And that, and it takes about a month to be able to really ship something. So a whole month or, or maybe even two. But, um, you know, that's when things are going to be ice free. So how, how reliably can I predict September of 24 now and next month and the month after and the month after as I approach September of 2024? And of course, once I get there, you know, it's going to be perfect. But, um, you know, what happens along the way and how reliably can I do that? So um, here's um, such an exercise, you know, uh, this happens to be for 2020. But we're working with simple models. If you think of Arctic sea ice as a function of time, kind of a time trend, and sea ice last, you know, think of sea ice in some month, okay, month M, as a function of time and a function of sea ice last month. So there's some dynamic kind of autoregressive effects. And, and sea ice this month so far, right? Because you know, we're thinking about average 
uh, CI, average of daily CIs over the month, and then, of course, uh, CIs today, the most recent observation. All of these things should be relevant. What's really re relevant is, is the whole past history, but it's so voluminous and so sort of untidy that you have to organize it in some way. And we've chosen to organize it in this way. So if you look, for example, in 2020 um, at, at the, the distributional forecast, here's in blue what we had in June, and in green what we had in July, and then August, and then September. And of course, September is much more peaked because we've got way more information by the time we get to September, and all the months you know, get more peaked as we go from June to July to August to September. And what you can see here is uh, the same sort of thing dynamically. Here's as we get uh, from days to target going from you know, several months out uh, or several, well, several months out to zero days out. You see how much sharper things get. Here, if we, if we don't go all the way into zero, we just stop at negative 20 because it goes up, it goes crazy, right? Once we get really close to the target, things are, things are, are just very easy. But you can see what happens uh, and, and what the path is, at, in this case, at any rate, in 2020. And, if you, and you can look here and see the, the basic um, scenario in terms of forecast uncertainty. Again, as we start 120 days out, lots of uncertainty, and of course, the actual forecast in, in green there moves some. But you see, as we, as we go in, it gets closer and closer. Um, and um, so let me just wrap up by saying that um, what I've implicitly showed you here is how we're doing relative to the standard climatological linear trend model, much better. Our, our forecast accuracy you know, is much less. You might want to know how we would do against a more sophisticated machine learning model. Our model is so simple that you could take it as the benchmark. It turns out that modern machine learning models don't do any better. Um, and we're working on that now and trying to understand why and how, they, how we might make them do better. So anyway, thank you very much.